Hello, everybody. I think we'll get started now. Uh, I wanted to recommend a book on the topic of theory and history. This will be a big surprise. The book on the topic theory and history is by von Mises. It's called Theory and History. <laughs> uh, this actually, I recommend this book very highly. It's the last of the four major works of Mises. You remember he had the theory of money and credit in 1912, then there's socialism, 1922, human action, 1949, and theory and history. And this is the last of his major works. And uh, it's, it's one advantage is uh, many people find Mises rather hard to read. Uh, the human action, especially, say, the first 140 pages or so, is not exactly the easiest book you have ever will encounter, at least unless you're unlike most people. But theory and history is a very easy book to read, at least it's easier than the others. So I, I think this is, if you find Mises difficult, this is a very good book to read. And it was also one that... Uh, Friedrich Hayek thought very highly of this book. I remember he told me in 1969 how much he admired this book. So this is a very good book to look at. Uh, now, I want to distinguish, in, when we talk about theory and history, I want, uh, we'll be talking about philosophy of history, and I want to distinguish uh, two different meanings of philosophy of history. And these correspond to two different meanings of the word history. When we're talking about history, we can refer to particular events in the past, significant events in the past, say, we're talking about the history of Europe, the history of the American Civil War, what we mean, what events were taking place. We're talking about what the historical actors did in the, the things that were done in the Latin phrase, the race gestae, the things that were done. But we can also mean by history uh, the activities or writings of historians who were writing about these events. So, uh, Sometimes it's called historiography, the writing of history. So if you uh, you could get, a, say, a book on the history of the American Civil War, which would deal not so much with the events of the Civil War, but would give you what various historians have said about it and what their different interpretations were. Uh, there is a book I would recommend. A book there is very interesting. One I think by called "The History of Historical Writing" by Harry Elmer Barnes. It's not always reliable, but uh, Barnes was someone that Murray Rothbard knew. He was a rather eccentric uh, historian. He had very controversial views on World War One and World War Two. But if you're interested in the history of historical writing, that would be. A good book, a uh, good book to read. Uh, one uh, story about Barnes I'll just throw in, as you know from now, I like digressions. Uh, I, when I was in high school, I once uh, called up Harry Elmer Barnes, who was uh, fairly old at that time, and I asked him what he thought of the 1964 election. That was the one where Barry Goldwater was a very right-wing candidate, was running against Lyndon Johnson. He said, as my old friend Henry Mencken said, I think I'll sit this one out. Uh, okay, so corresponding, corresponding to these two meanings of history, namely the events of the past and the activities of historians in writing about them, we, would, we have two uh, meanings for philosophy of history. What philosophy of history can refer to uh, the view that there's some pattern 
to all of history. There's some meaning to the whole series of historical events. So in addition, say, to the history of Europe, history of the United States, there is a meaning to the total process of history. There is something that will, depending on how much time we have in the lecture, I'll say a little bit about some of these philosophies of history. Later examples would be uh, the Marxist theory of history. There's something like there's a claim that there's a whole meaning or pattern to history based on the development of the forces of production throughout history, that this will lead from a stage of primitive communism to eventually to socialism as the forces develop. So this is claiming there's a pattern to all of history. Marx wasn't the only one who had a philosophy of history in this sense. Uh, Hegel had one very famously, uh, Oswald Spengler, Decline of the West, is an example of a philosophy of history. Has anyone read Spengler? He was, it's very much worth reading, Decline of the West. That's very good. Cool. Another one, Arnold Toynbee, Study of History. So there are various people who claim there's a whole pattern to history and philosophy of history in that sense it would be explained that. So you see how this corresponds to this history in the, in the first sense, I just think the philosophy of history would be trying to uh, talk about the meaning of historical events. Now, corresponding to the second sense, which was the activities of historians, philosophy of history mean, mean, means an investigation of some of the problems and methods that the historian uses in trying to understand the past. So this doesn't at all assume that there's a pattern to all of history, but in this sense of philosophy of history, which is the one we'll be concentrating on in this lecture, uh, we're talking about philosophical problems concerned with historical knowledge. What is the nature of historical knowledge? How is the historian able to know the past if, in fact, he is able to know the past? There are some people who question this, uh, who are very skeptical. There was a philosopher, Jack Myland, who had a book who was very critical of the notion of historical knowledge, but this is the sort of thing we're studying in this type of philosophy of history. Now, the first point I want to cover in philosophy of history in this sense is how can the historian use praxeology in helping to explain historical events? Now, you'll remember from my first lecture and from other lectures and readings you have, that praxeology is a science of human action. It deals with action as such, the generality of action. It doesn't tell you about particular actions. It doesn't say uh, people are now, you can't, you couldn't have a praxeological uh, theorem that people are now attending my lecture. That's a particular fact. It isn't deducible from any of the praxeological uh, theorems that any particular event takes place or will take place. So then the question would be, well, if that's the case, what use is praxeology to the historian? And one way in which praxeology is, is useful is that although you, uh, the historian can't deduce particular events from praxeology, he can use praxeology to help him explain uh, particular events. For example, if you look at uh, Murray Rothbard's book, America's Great Depression, which came out in 1963, it was, it's on the <coughs> origins of the 1929 Depression. Uh, what he does there is he applies Austrian business cycle theory, which is 
derived from praxeology. And this, because he knows Austrian pra praxeology, he's able, this gives him clues as to what to look at in trying to understand the depression. Uh, for example, in Austrian business cycle theory, again, I'm sure Roger Garrison and others have covered this in their lectures. In Austrian business cycle theory, the a boom starts because uh, banks have expanded bank credit so that the interest rate uh, falls below the uh, what's called the natural rate of interest, which is determined by time preference. So as money becomes available with a lower interest rate, this encourages uh, investors to embark on projects that they otherwise wouldn't have. And then when the credit expansion stops, these projects prove to be unsustainable. And the liquidation of these projects is the depression. That's when the, the, the bank credit expansion <laughs> proves to be, is no longer effective. The interest rate returns to the natural rate as determined by time preference. So these malinvestments collapse. Now, if, uh, say, Rothbard, when he, of course, he, he knew about this theory, so what he was looking for when he was trying to explain the depression was, he was looking for, an, was, the, was there an expansion of bank credit in the 1920s? And he found that there was. He, he argues in the book that the Federal Reserve System, largely under the influence of the governor of the Bank of New York, Benjamin Strong, uh, was engaged in a in a monetary expansion that caused the process that the Austrian business cycle theory is talking about. And you can see how the Austrian theory has guided him because if he didn't have the Austrian theory, if he, if he were just looking at prices, say just looking at price data, prices really didn't go up very much in the 20s. So if the, if the historian wasn't aware of the Austrian theory, he probably wouldn't be looking for expansionary monetary policy. But because Rothbard's aware and makes use of this theory, he, he's looking for that, and then he can say, well, even if prices aren't, weren't going up that much, we would think that otherwise they would have gone down. So you see, he's guided by the Austrian Austrian theory in by praxeology in carrying out his research. Now, oh, incidentally, I should say on uh, that book, America's Great Depression, that's uh, another book everyone should read. Uh, uh, this will show you how old I am. I remember very well when the book came out in 1963. So uh, probably most of you were not born at that time. Maybe some of your parents weren't born at that time, but I, uh, I remember it very well, and I read it when it came out. And uh, this is another book that Friedrich Hayek thought very highly of. He told me that, that he thought Rothbard had done a really good job in this book. Now, another example uh, is uh, where showing how the historian can use praxeology is in the brief account, you'll find in the brief account of the decline of the Roman Empire that Mises uh, provides in human action. And what Mises stresses there is that because of price controls imposed by in the late Roman Empire, this disrupted the commercial activity. There had been a very active economy, engaged, extensive commercial exchanges that were going on previously, but the price control really disrupted things so that production tended to be confined to the large estates, the latifundias, and 
the economy really regressed. It was no longer engaged. The, the worldwide trade greatly was greatly reduced, and this weakened the the Roman Empire and couldn't adequately respond to the various invasions. Uh, whereas previously, they've been the Roman Empire been able to overcome them, and here. Mises was relying on a uh, work, a famous work by Michael Rostovsev, who was a, a Russian historian who had gone into exile after the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. He lived in the United States. Called the book is called "The Social and Economic History of the Roman Empire." So here again, we see Mises is applying. Uh, perhaps you obviously hear the basic point in uh, in economic theory, namely wage the how wage and price controls can disrupt the working of a market in explaining a historical event. Uh, now, one point uh, to note is that just as the historian guided by praxeology will be applying Austrian insight to explain historical events. Uh, remember, not all historians are praxeologists. People, historians who have other theories will be applying those theories to help them understand the past. Uh, and so this can lead to differences of opinion. For example, uh, at the same year that uh, Rothbard's America's Great Depression came out in 1963, there was a, another book that came out uh, uh, by Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz called A Monetary History of the United States. And this book was much more influential on mainstream economists, from my point of view, unfortunately, than Rothbard's book. But what uh, Friedman was a follower, uh, believed in the quantity theory of money, and what he thought was the depression had come about because the the Fed really contracted the money supply drastically after the stock market crash, and he thought this had they're doing this had meant that what was sort of just a bad uh, fall in the stock market uh, became a major depression. So on his theory, he's looking he's looking for contractions of the money supply. So you see, this is just the other way from Rothbard, who's stressing expansion of the money supply in the 1920s. So Friedman and Schwartz are saying no. The important thing is the contraction of the money supply in the, when the depression started. So I see here how the theory, different theories guide the historian in looking for data in uh, trying to figure out what happened. Rothbard doesn't think that the Fed did contract the money supply. He said, well, there was a contraction, but the Fed was just reacting to people who were withdrawing money from circulation. They weren't trying deliberately to contract the money supply. And here again, you see how the different theories guide what the historian is doing. Uh, now, another example where different theories can showing how different theories affect or influence what the historian is doing, uh, concerns the interpretation of fascism. Now, according to the Marxist view, which was the prevailing, probably the prevailing view of fascism in the 1930s and 40s among historians, uh, fascism is a, a stage of capitalism. In the Marxist interpretation, uh, large monopolies will tend to arise in the capitalist system. And because of the, the 
capitalist system proves unable to cope with economic crisis and rising protests and strikes by workers. So there's a resort, a resort to an authoritarian system where uh, uh, leaders suppress the workers and regiment everyone under the control of a big business interest. And uh, there's an uh, and also in pursuit of markets in the um, in this Marxist view, uh, the fascist government tend to f follow an imperialist foreign policy. So in the Marxist interpretation, it's really the big business that's in control. It isn't, this is the source of fascism. But Mises rejected this view as you might expect. In his view, he said, well, uh, the Nazi system was not one that was dominated by big business. On the contrary, in the Nazi economy, the government was telling the businesses what to do. The government was really setting the prices and wages in the business people, although they, in, in, uh, theory owned their businesses really had to do whatever the government said. So they were really just government officials. They weren't uh, independent operators. So it wasn't at all the case as the Marxists say that the um, it was the big business that was in control. Uh, so he, uh, there was a book, if you're interested in the Marxist view, uh, there was a book by Franz Neumann uh, called Behemoth, came out Oxford, I think in the 1940s, probably the most influential statement of the Marxist view. And then a book, if you want the Mises interpretation of fascism and Nazism, uh, you should look at Omnipotent Government, which came out in 1944. That's one of the best books I think on the history of the uh, 20th century, I think if I had to give one book on the interpretation of the Nazis and totalitarianism, I think I would give recommend that one, the omnipotent government. So what I've said so far is uh, showing how praxeology uh, will help the historian because the historian can apply praxeology to help him explain concrete historical events. Now this, is a more instance of a more general point, which is that uh, Mises gives uh, the historian will apply the results of the sciences in helping him explain events. And I give one example. I mentioned this in an earlier lecture also, but I'll, I'll give it again, is that Mises gives the example. He said, supposing a historian was trying to explain the witchcraft craze at various periods in in uh, European history, say in the late 16th century, there was widespread accusations of witchcraft uh, in Europe. There were people put on trial and in some cases burned at the stake because they were witches. Incidentally, in uh, in America, you know, you'll read there was a witchcraft there was a witchcraft scare, but no one in America was ever burned for witchcraft. The witches were hanged and not burned. You'll sometimes see that people make that mistake. But supposing the historian was trying to explain uh, what was going on in these witchcraft uh, crazes. So Mises said, well, one thing a 20th century historian wouldn't do would be to say what was going on was the devil was really in communication with these various women and there happened to be an upsurge in, in his, their activities in this period. And he said, well, we wouldn't, this 20th century historian wouldn't do that because uh, based on modern science, we don't believe in the people are in communication with the devil in this way. And I thought it was bit odd that uh, he picked this example because as it happens, uh, one of the greatest 20th century historians of witchcraft was a rather 
odd uh, character. Now, if I say someone's an odd character, you can be sure they're really odd. Uh, but his name was Montague Summers. He was uh, claimed to be an Anglican priest, but there was some doubt whether he was really was one. But he wrote in his uh, books on history of witchcraft, he took exactly, which were 20th century, he took exactly the view that Mises said no 20th century historian would take. He said, well, these people really were in communication with the devil. Now, of course, Mises would just say he shouldn't have done that. He was not uh, acting pro as a good historian in doing that, but nevertheless, he, that's exactly what he did do. Uh, now, one thing about praxeology, to re it's in returning to a point I made at the beginning of the lecture, is that praxeology doesn't enable you to predict particular events. For example, uh, we know from the Austrian business cycle theory that credit expansion we can explain the effects of credit expansion, but we couldn't, from just from Austrian business cycle theory, deduce what, how much of an expansion, what these exactly these effects are quantitatively, what they're going to be, or who would do something, who wouldn't do something else. We can't deduce particular details from just from praxeology. So. This, of course, raises the question, well, if we can't use praxeology, how is the historian going to explain particular historical events? Because, after all, history consists of particular actions by particular people, and the historian's trying to explain these. Uh, one way would be to agree with Henry Ford and give up. Henry Ford said, history is bunk. Uh, if you don't want to do that, then you have a problem of historical explanation. Uh, so, just as a matter of interest, uh, Mises, as you know, was usually a very strong critic of the logical positivists. Remember, the logical positivists said uh, Mises was wrong in thinking that you can get genuine knowledge through a priori truth. Remember, an a priori uh, truth is one that you can know to be true apart from testing. You just think about it and you see that it's true. So the logical positivists rejected this, but Mises said praxeology consists of a priori truths. But he agreed with them that you can't get knowledge of contingent historical facts from just by thinking about them. A contingent f fact would be one that might not have happened. For example, you're in this room now, you probably regret that you are, but you might not have been. You might have gone somewhere else. You'd be better off if you had, but that's not my problem, is it? <laughs> so, supposing we have a, something, so if a, a fact is a contingent, if it might not have happened, then uh, Mises, uh, here he's agreeing with the logical positives, you thought you couldn't deduce it, just you couldn't deduce it from some general body of theory. You can't just think about someone and say, well, he's going to be attending this lecture, or he's going somewhere else, that would be something you could just know just by empirically. So then again, the question where I is, well, how do you explain these uh, contingent events? Uh, now, one possibility, well, could we, uh, could we have historical laws that weren't praxeological. Remember, praxeological laws are a priori true. We get them just by thinking about the concept of action or the action axiom. So, supposing we can't do that, historical events are, are contingent. They need not have happened. So, could we have historical laws? 
And Mises says, no, we couldn't. And uh, why, uh, why is that? Well, he says, if there were historical laws, then they'd be derived by, indu by induction. Say the historian would get a whole lot of events and then kind of study them to see whether there's any pattern in them. Uh, is there any generalization can make based on amassing a great deal of historical data? And Mises, for various reasons, thought that, which I'll get into, I hope, thought that the historian couldn't do that. And one of the most important reasons Mises thought the historian couldn't come up with Historic with inductive laws. Remember, these would not be praxeological laws. They would be laws based on generalizations, just looking at data and seeing, seeing patterns. Was well, he said that uh, human beings have free will, that we always have a choice of action involves choice. So this, if action involves choice, where the, the uh, actually is choosing an alternative, this severely limits, if not takes away altogether, the ability of someone to come up with historical laws because the historical actors have freedom in deciding what to do. He takes human choice to be an ultimate, what he calls an ultimate given. Uh, I'll mention my great friend, uh, Father James Sadowski, used to have an argument for free will was uh, we wouldn't have the concept of free will unless we had it. Uh, and I, I once mentioned that to another friend of mine, Bob Nozick, who was very good on quick response, and Nozick said, maybe we wouldn't have the concept of bad arguments unless we had them. <laughs> but uh, regardless of the success of that particular argument, uh, Mises uh, took it to be an ultimate given that uh, we have free will. Uh, now, if, if we can't come up with uh, historical laws, it doesn't follow from that that the historian can't explain particular events. Now, you might think, well, how is that possible? Because when we explain something, doesn't that at least most often involve subsuming this under a general law. Say, if we explain why did uh, why did an object fall? Say, if I were to drop this, why would it fall on the floor? I'm not going to drop it because it would ruin the rest of my slides, or not ruin my access to the rest of the slide. But why would it fall? So you would explain this by applying the law of gravitation to this particular event. <laughs> so if the historian can't use, there aren't general laws, then how is he going to explain particular events? Well, what's left without general laws? It, Mises' answer is that the historian can grasp the individual, the individuality of an action at, without using general law. So in general laws, we're saying, how does a particular event fall under some more general pattern? But what the historian is doing is just trying to grasp the individuality of the act, trying to grasp what the particular act, actor is doing without claiming that what the actor is doing falls under general laws, without saying, well, what does, what he's, what the, person is do the historical actor is doing, how does this uh, relate to other events? It's just grasping the individuality of the action as such. Uh, now, he calls this uh, method of grasping the individuality, he uses the German word verstehen, which means uh, understanding, he sometimes calls it specific understanding, specific as opposed to general. We're getting the individuality of the action. Well, I've said that uh, a large number of times, the individuality of the action, but that really doesn't give you a 
really good idea of what's involved. How is the historian supposed to grasp the individuality of the action? Uh, well, what Mises suggests is that the person who's, who's acting, the, hist the historical actor that the historian's concerned with, will uh, have certain values and beliefs on the basis of which he acts. And because we ourselves are actors, we're everyone acts, we know what it's like to have particular beliefs and desires. So we can, by attributing uh, certain beliefs or desires to the actor, we can make sense of what the person is doing. So just as, say, we would have, we, we act in certain ways, say, you want to have lunch, so you go down to the downstairs and get in the line and get your your sandwich, get your uh, get your anti anti poison antidote afterwards. So we could explain what you're doing based on your beliefs and desires. So similarly, the historian can attribute beliefs and desires to historical actors and that's uh, the way he explains events. So what this story is doing, he's, he'll make what means called judgments of relevance about particular events. He'll say how there are various uh, factors influencing the, per, the person, the historical actor. And the historian will, just by a process of sympathetic understanding, a specific understanding, he'll attribute beliefs and desires to the, a uh, particular actor. Uh, so supposing an example, a historian's trying to explain why Abraham Lincoln decided in, in uh, after he became president in March 1861, he decided to reinforce the garrison at Fort Sumter, even though he knew that doing so would probably uh, mean that the uh, that the fort would be attacked and the civil war would result. So we could say what the historian could say what beliefs and desires would the Lincoln have had that would explain why he did that. Uh, say he we could say well we know from his speeches and beliefs that he had he believed that the union was couldn't be dissolved, that states didn't have the power to leave the Union. He was a very strong nationalist. He wanted to promote American power. So if we attribute this belief to him, this can help explain why he, uh, why he decided to do that. So you see here, the historian wouldn't be appealing to general laws. He's attributing particular uh, desires and beliefs to Lincoln that would enable him to explain what's going on. Uh, incidentally, uh, do you know what the manager of Ford's Theater said to Mrs. Lincoln the day after the assassination? Uh, was, uh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Lincoln, no ticket refunds under any circumstances. Don't, don't put that in your notes. It won't be on the exam. Uh, uh, now, one uh, thing to mistake to avoid when, I, when I've been talking about this notion of sympathetic understanding, this does not, repeat, not mean that the historian has to like the, what the actor's doing, has to sympathize with the historical actor in the sense of approving of what he does or taking a favorable attitude toward what he does. Uh, say you're trying to explain Lincoln policy, and you say, well, Lincoln was trying to, uh, wanted a strong American national state. You don't have to think he was if you're attributing that to, to Lincoln, you don't have to think, well, Link, Lincoln was doing the right thing in that. And I mention this because one of the greatest philosophers, they arguably 
the greatest contemporary philosopher, Saul Kripke, uh, has in the, an essay, he criticized R.G. Collingwood, who had a view where he liked me. In fact, I may be getting to this later in the lecture. Uh, Collingwood was a British philosopher and historian. He had a Mises thought very highly of him, and he was somewhat influenced by Collingwood. But Collingwood had a theory like of a kind I've been explaining where the historian is trying to attribute beliefs and desires to the historical actor based on this kind of sympathetic understanding. So Kripke objects, he says, well, uh, supposing historians trying to give an account of Hitler, wouldn't this lead to the historian who was trying to get a sympathetic understanding of Hitler? Wouldn't this lead to the historian coming to like Hitler, coming to defend Hitler because he's trying to explain what he did? And uh, Kripke gave us an example. There was a British military historian, David Irving, who wrote a book about uh, World War II kind of from Hitler's point of view, and he became very sympathetic to Hitler. So Kripke said, well, isn't this what's a danger in this method of specific understanding or sympathetic understanding? But you see here, I don't think that objection is right, because here what the historian is doing is attributing values to the historical actor, but the historian isn't adopting those values himself, so the historian isn't making a value judgment of his own that these uh, values are a good thing. Uh, it's uh, The historian is engaged in a, a descriptive science. He's not making value judgments. And Mises says that hist history can be written in a value-neutral way. So even if you're engaged in sympathetic understanding of what the historical actors are doing, this doesn't follow that you're trying to, you have to adopt the values you attribute to them. Uh, now, one other mistake people make in uh, thinking about this specific understanding of first day is they think, well, if you're trying to understand someone's values and beliefs, then what are you going to be looking at? You'll be looking at what the person has said. You'll be looking at his, uh, at his, what he's, speeches or writing. So doesn't this lead to taking what he says at face value, but it doesn't at all. The historian can still compare what the person has done with historical facts. You can credit, you can point out that someone's, what someone said doesn't correspond to what he did. Uh, for example, say you're talking about Lincoln, you can say, well, he didn't really uh, did he, what, if you say, uh, someone say a tribute to Lincoln, the goal of freeing the slaves, you could say the Emancipation Proclamation really didn't do that. It was more of a military measure. So you could compare what someone says to what actually took place. Uh, and I mentioned, I mentioned, I have a note here, because I think this is, a, a, there's a, essay by Mises called The Treatment of Irrationality in Social Sciences, where he may, this hasn't, I think, gotten as much attention, or this part of the essay hasn't gotten as much attention as it deserves, where he makes a criticism of the great uh, medievalist Ernst Kantorowicz. Uh, Kantorowicz was a German historian who later went into exile and taught at Berkeley. And he says, uh, Kantorowicz, in his great biography of Frederick II, uh, takes at face value the statements of the, uh, in the Holy Roman Empire, say statements by the various emperors and other people. And he talks about the symbolism of these statements. And Mises criticizing, he said, well, he doesn't really uh, ask, did these 
statements correspond to reality? Did they correspond to the actual political fat, uh, power politics of a time? So I put that in to show that sympathetic understanding or specific understanding doesn't require you to accept what the historical actors said at face value. Incidentally, when Mises, I, it's very significant, I don't think it's uh, people draw attention to this enough, but Kantorowicz, you see, was in this particular book, he was really, it was very much admired by the German nationalists of the 1920s and 1930s. And what Mises was doing, criticizing Kantorowicz, he's really, in a way, attacking the German nationalists. Uh, it was uh, one of the readers of Kantorowicz's book, great admirer of the book, was uh, was Hitler. Hitler thought very highly of this particular book that Mises criticized. Somewhat ironic that Hitler liked the book because Kantorowicz was Jewish, but he, he thought highly of it. So I think what, I just throw this in as one of my typical digressions, that what Mises was doing was really in this passage is really criticizing a type of national, German nationalist uh, history writing. Now, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Mises, in developing this notion, his notion of Verstehen or specific understanding, was influenced by the British uh, historian and philosopher uh, R.G. Collingwood, Robin George Collingwood. Collingwood was, uh, besides being a historian, was also, a, and a philosopher was also an archaeologist. He was one of the leading uh, archaeologists of Roman Britain, but he's probably best known as a historian. So what uh, Collingwood said, and you can find this in a book that came out after his death called The Idea of History. It was edited by uh, Sir Malcolm Knox, who had been one of his students, T.M. Knox. But what he said is that the historian, in trying to reconstruct the thoughts of someone in the past, is having the identical thoughts and desires of that person. So if, say, Imagine a historian trying to understand what Lincoln, uh, Lincoln's policy in March 1861. If a historian is successful, he's thinking exactly the same thoughts as Lincoln. And when Collingwood said that, he meant that in a very extreme sense. He didn't mean something like you're having qualitatively the same thoughts as Lincoln did. So say, imagine each of you is thinking about praxeology right now. What else would you be thinking about? Uh, so imagine each of you is thinking about praxeology. Suppose you're, we could say you're thinking the same thing in, in meaning by that. The content is the same in each one of your mind. Collingwood went further than that. He said it's not only the same content, but it's numerically the same. It just is the same thought. So the historian is really, who's gotten Lincoln right, is thinking exactly Lincoln's thoughts. Now, Mises didn't go that far. That view of identity is really something you find in the British idealist philosophy, but it's a somewhat, as I say, somewhat extreme view, but that was Collingwood's view. Uh, and there were other, his, other uh, philosophers and historians who had who wrote about uh, Furstein, and I just mentioned a few of them. Uh, they included German philosophers Wilhelm Windelbond, uh, Heinrich uh, uh, Wilhelm Diltai, also Heinrich Rickert, and the Italian Benedetto Croce. So all there was a whole group of people, they didn't have identical views, either in the ordinary sense or in Collingwood sense, but a lot of people, uh, uh, say in the late 19th, early 20th century, century were writing about Verstehen and historical understanding, and Mises is in this tradition. 
Now, uh, what about uh, the people who reject Frishte and the logical positivists didn't say, okay, Mises is right. You know, we have to make special room for this kind of Frishte and specific understanding. They rejected uh, what he what Mises said and what the people in this tradition said. And uh, one of the most important of the positivist uh, treatments of uh, Frischte, and I wouldn't say that the, this writer was a strict logical positivist, but he belongs in the general in this group, was the philosopher of science, Ernest Nagel, who taught at Columbia. He was actually one of Murray Rothbard's teachers. Uh, Rothbard actually liked Nagel quite a bit, but he had a very important book called The Structure of Science. And what he said was, well, you can have this method of specific understanding if you want, but that might give you some idea of what was going on in history. You say, could get some idea of why Lincoln thought something or other, but that doesn't give you any real reason to accept that what you come up with is true. All that you've got is some, some kind of story about what happened. The only way, according to the people who favor Verstehen, of seeing whether it's true is just, does this seem to you to be right? Say, imagine, and Mises, I think, would certainly admit this. Suppose you read some account of Lincoln's policy. So, does this strike you as plausible? Does this particular attribution of motives and beliefs to Lincoln strike you as a plausible one in explaining what he did? If you answer yes, that's all that you have. So Nagel said, well, that really isn't scientific. That just depends on how particular people take something. It doesn't really tell you what's, uh, give you a basis for accepting it. So he said, uh, for Stein may be a good way of generating hypotheses, but it doesn't address at all the problem of how testing them or verifying them or falsifying them. Uh, and what they said is what the historian is doing, remember this is just what Mises rejected, they, they said what the historian should be doing is trying to come up with explain an event through an appeal to a general law. The most important article in giving this view is, came out in uh, 1942 by Carl Hempel, who was one of the, he'd been in, associated with the Vienna Circle and later taught at Princeton. He was the one of uh, Robert Nozick's teachers there. He, very good philosopher. Everyone, I recommend should read his book called Aspects of Scientific Explanation, which came out in 1965. But in his essay uh, the, uh, on the function of general laws in history in 1942, uh, he advanced what was generally referred to follow, uh, called the covering law model. This is name given to it by another uh, writer on philosophy of history, uh, William H. Dre. And what Hempel said was, uh, the way you explain, uh, wait, did I, this is, uh, uh, the way you explain an event is to bring it under a general law. So you would say, here's a particular event, what general law applies here, and you explain the event by saying, this is an instance of this general law. And the problem with that, as I mentioned earlier, is that there aren't such general laws. So if you took that model, you really wouldn't be able to make a, a historical explanation. Uh, for example, supposing you're trying to explain why Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon River in 49 BC, where he, he, 
he disobeyed the order of the Roman Senate not to do that. Well, we don't have historical laws of the form. I give us uh, ambitious generals who are faced with an order that they think detracts from their honor will disobey it. We don't have such general laws. All we could do is explain the particular uh, action that Caesar took on that occasion. Uh, now, one thing I uh, just mentioned, I discussed this a little bit in my uh, lecture, one of my lectures on Wednesday, is historian also uses uh, in carrying out specific understanding or for staying, uses what's called ideal types following, uh, this is a term that Mises took over from Max Weber. And here, ideal doesn't mean perfect. It means something not found in the real world. It's ideal in the sense of not actually existing. But it's what you do in an ideal type is you take an exaggerated, you bring together certain characteristic traits of something like a personality type. So you'll have the ideal type of the bourgeois, and you'll attribute certain traits to him. Using that ideal type can help you explain particular historical events. Uh, now, as and I give, say, your, your, uh, I gave us the ideal type of the bourgeois. So, an idea, your, this would enable you, say, explain certain acts by various people in, say, in the late 19th century were engaged in business expansion. So you say, well, there you use the ideal type of the bourgeois who's interested in making a lot of money or achieving a certain position through wealth. And ideal types don't have strict definitions. They're just uh, assem assemblages of characteristics that can be met or not met to very degrees. Uh, now, Max Weber thought that one ideal type was the rational actor. But remember, Mises doesn't agree with that. Mises says, no, every action is rational. So according to Max Weber, it's only specific kinds of action count as rational, but uh, Mises didn't accept that. Uh, now, the last thing I see we're about out of time, but the last thing I'll mention is that, remember when I started the lecture near the beginning, I mentioned this notion of philosophy of history in the sense of trying to come up with some kind of general pattern to all of history. And Mises is very unsympathetic to that notion because he thinks that the dominant kinds of philosophy of history in that sense uh, con contravene methodological individualism. Remember, methodological individualism is the principle that only individuals act. So we don't have, we talk about collectives, they act only through individuals. And Mises points out that the most influential of the philosophies of history violate this for example, they'll, in Hegel, have the notion of kind of the world spirit or Geist as some kind of independent entity that was acting. Marx has the forces of production as if this is some kind of autonomous entity developing apart from individuals. And in Spengler's theory, you have cultures, which he, Spengler compares to plants, not industrial plants, but biological plants, the sort of organisms that are have early stages, growth and decay. So in all these cases that Mises rejects them because they violate methodological individualism. So I don't want to violate the constraint of, of sticking to the right time. So I'll stop here. We're out of time. Thanks very much. Thank